Welcome to Utah State University's Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany class. This is lecture 21 in which we'll attempt to answer the question, what are fossil graptolites and why are they useful in geology? Graptolites um, basically mean grapto, which is Greek for to write, and lights in Greek for stone. So these are written stones. These are very weird uh, fossils that are found in, usually in black shales and they are these weird sort of writing like features, these fossils that for many years people sort of pondered what these things really were. It looked like someone had taken some chalk and written on some black, black uh, shale. Um, they're placed within the subphylum Hemichordata. Now the Hemichordata is a living group today. They include some interesting tube worms, the penis worm, some other really interesting invertebrates. Um, and they're placed within their own class called the Graftolithia. They're commonly found in the Cambrian to Devonian, often in these black shales. So they're often found as fossils in units that don't necessarily have very many other types of fossils found in them. Now, this is the first group of invertebrates that we're looking at with a fossil record that doesn't have a calcified skeleton. It doesn't have a skeleton made of calcium carbonate, um, no calcite, no aragonite, things like that that we saw with the mollusks um, and that we'll see again with the arthropods. So graptolites are actually what they are, carbonized or kaolinized films that are on the shales. So this is sort of the remnants of the organic matter that compose their bodies that are preserved in the rock record. So they don't have calcium carbonate and hence they're not big reef builders. And they're sort of peculiar. We'll talk a little bit about what these things might actually be. So the preservation is very different in terms of graptolites than the other fossils that we have seen so far in this class. Um, they're found only in very fine limestones or mudstones or carbonaceous shales. And um, when found, they kind of look like little marks on the, uh, the shale. And these are sort of remnants of the original organic carbon that's been sort of carbonized or, or kind of coal, coal, turned into kind of coal or something like that. In preparing the specimens, what scientists have done and paleontologists have done that study graptolites is that they dissolve the rock, um, usually in a combination of hydrochloric acid, they'll get rid of the um, calcite cement, and then they will use hydrofluoric acid, which will get rid of some of the silica. And that leaves behind a sort of the organic carbon film, the original fossil. It's a very delicate process and only a handful of specimens have been prepared this way to such detail that we can kind of study these things in three dimensions. Most graptolites are found in two dimensions, sort of squished between the layers of shale. So why do we care about graptolites? What's their, uh, what's their meaning? What's their purpose in geology? Um, graptolites are a very interesting group in the fact that they are readily preserved and they can be identified. Um, to different species. Now these species are a little bit different than the species we've been talking about in that we don't have preserved the entire body. Oftentimes it's these little graphs, these little uh, fragments of these fossils that are preserved and they're often preserved in these black shales where we may not have any other fossils to go on. So graptolites came to importance in biostratigraphy in being able to map out different biozones in the rock record, uh, in particular sedimentary rocks where we don't typically find many fossils in. Let's talk about the first order, the order Graptoloididae. This is a group in which we've prepared out some of the uh, specimens to get kind of a look at sort of the anatomy of what these, these things are. So, they oftentimes will have little spines that go up and down them, so they kind of look like uh, razor saws. And what those are, are basically surrounding these little openings, these little apertures, which possibly housed a zooid. So these are probably colonial organisms, uh, though it's difficult to say, um, that a zooid of some sort would live in. And then each one of these little openings, these little apertures along these sort of razor blade edges of these things, was home to sort of colonial organisms. Um, what's interesting about these colonial organisms 
is that they are interconnected. And so uh, many scientists have hypothesized that a nerve cell ran between the zooids that allowed them to sort of communicate with each other. And as such, they're sort of uh, in between a colonial organism and a single organism. They're very peculiar in the way that they form their, um, their skeleton. The other order is the order Dendrodoidae. Uh, Dendrodroidae. The other order is the order Dendrodroidae. These um, tend to be ones that seem to be more attached. Uh, it's hypothesized that these guys may have been uh, more sessile, although there's some that are probably uh, floaters. Um, so these might have been sort of like uh, growing like a plant. Again, they have a uh, openings, apertures that grow out, um, composed of this organic matter that they compose their skeletons. A good example is Diplographus here, um, an example of one of those dendroidids. The order dendroidids have these uh, stoleal systems, these canals or tubes that connect the various um, autothecia, these little vessels. Um, so oftentimes the stone, stola are pretty pronounced and form quite a bit of the skeleton of these things. It's made out of organic carbon, uh, connecting each of these um, apertures that house some sort of creature, some zooid, that probably was filter feeding. Now, the skeleton itself is made out of collagen, or that's at least what scientists believe the original matter uh, was composed of. And of course, when it's buried under heat and pressure, and these are very old, Devonian to Cambrian, uh, that, that original collagen uh, basically breaks down into smaller units of carbon um, and hydrogen bonds. Um, but probably was originally collagen, um, some sort of organic matter that held these things together. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is you get these coracle bandages, and these are evidence that in each one of these little cups there was a individual zooid, and they communicated with each other through a stoma system. You see banding on the edge um, down in here, underneath the apertures. And this is usually indication or interpreted as being growth rings of the zooid. So the zooid would basically build up those growth rings around the aperture as it grew over, over time. Um, so this is an example of, of a very nice, probably one of the best examples of a three-dimensional image of a graptolite in detail. This is Orthographis gracilis. Now, one of the interesting things about graptolites is that we're starting to kind of get a clue of what they might actually represent and some possible living relatives that do this type of uh, skeletal growth using collagen. Um, they appear to be closely related to the petrobranchs. These are the hemichordate, the uh, members of the hemichordates, uh, worm-like creatures that live in the ocean. Um, these include the tube worms that you often see uh, in deep sea vents that were discovered in the 1970s when oceanographers went into the deep sea vents. They build their tubes out of collagen that they grow. And um, here's an example of um, Raptopleura compactia. This is a, 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 a terabrachian colony. And they basically are these little tube wormy things that have a they have sort of a food tentacles that come out. They have a proboscis. They wave those tentacles back and forth and are filter feeding. In the deep sea vents, they actually can do some exchange with some of the bacteria that feed on the hydrogen sulfide in deep sea vents where there's no, no uh, sunlight getting down there. Um, and then they basically secrete around their structure this um, skeleton, this tube that holds them in, that's made out of collagen. And you can see that it has some of the same similar structures that we see in the graptolites in the fossil record, where they basically um, secrete this collagen around to form these like tubes that they can live in. And then they can retract into these tubes. So it's not calcium carbonate like we saw with the bryozoans or brachiopods. This is collagen that they're basically uh, exuding, and then they have this, um, this portion that comes out and does the filter feeding with tentacles that comes out, the, the worm itself. Now living petrobranchs have a fossil record that actually extends all the way back to the Cambrian. Um, here's an example of one of the Cambrian uh, petrobranchs um, has a fossil uh, record. Um, and the modern uh, cephalodiscalus here 
Um, in fact, if you look at it, its skeleton, the, the colony of skeletons made of collagen of a modern one, this is one now of the Smithsonian Museum, um, you'll note that it has a very similar type of structure that we see in the graptolites. And so it's thought that the graptolites were sort of an early branch off the hemichordates um, and survived in a little bit different ways than modern petrobranchs that live kind of deep in the ocean. And what they did was basically be floaters, be planktonic, rather than necessarily being tied down or being sessile, although some of the um, graptolites were sessile organisms. Now, graptolites are really diverse. I mean, there's all sorts of shapes um, and sizes of graptolites that are found in the rock record. Many, many different types of graptolites have been described, and they can be easily identified too, just by having a splitting a shell and finding some of these really interesting things. An incredible amount of diversity of graptolites. Some of the weirdest graptolites are these. Um, these are just bizarre. They almost look like gears, or they don't really look like organic things. They look man-made. Um, Oftentimes you'll see news stories about graptolites as being some sort of gears or some sort of um, futuristic time machine that's preserved in the fossil record. They're very bizarre. Um, oftentimes they'll form these spirals that look like gears with the individual apertures um, that appear almost as if they are like uh, the notches in a gear. Um, sometimes you see uh, a variety of different forms when these actually were held together as a single unit, they break apart. So some of them have these long straight pieces and others the sort of twisty, twirly pieces. Um, most of these really bizarre uh, graptolites were planktonic, meaning they floated around. And that's how they got out into these black shales that they would fall out, uh, sink down onto the ocean floor, and then get buried fairly quickly. So this is my favorite. This is kind of the same one that I showed you before, but this is the one with those straight edges attached to that spiral. This is Cridographius, um, which is, you know, pretty, pretty amazing little fossil. So these guys have the spirals, and then they had the straight edges that came off with these colonial organisms. And it's thought that they floated planktonically in the ocean waters. Some of them are really bizarre. These are the um, Retolites. This is uh, Gothiographus. And they form actually an intricate network of little openings that probably housed individual zooids and was a little colonial uh, organism um, that probably may have been on a stock um, in a netted skeleton. Um, this is of course is collagen and this is prepared using acid to etch away the rock and leaving behind the organic sort of original skeleton of these organisms. Uh, beautiful pres preservation. Most of these are fairly small. Um, they really get over 10 centimeters. All right, so how did graftolites live? Well, there's two different types. The dendroides were mostly sessile, um, lived on the ocean floor, um, branching zooid organisms, um, again, making their skeletons out of collagen rather than um, uh, calcite, calcium carbonate, like we saw with the bryozoans, but feeding and existing in very similar ways as the bryozoans. But these are probably unrelated. They're probably related to the hemichordates uh, of today. Um, some of them were kind of, may have attached loosely to seaweed or something like that and actually floated upside down like uh, the graptolite. Very interesting groups. The graptoloides, these are the ones that we find in many of the black carbonaceous shales. Uh, these are the planktonic floaters. And this is a uh, sort of reconstruction of what one of these might have looked like. It's believed that they may have had air sacs to help support them so they would float. So. These organisms were maybe colonial, but they actually, with these openings, but probably attached within a network and communicated with each other via uh, a nerve exchange. And hence, even though they're colonial with different types of little zooids that, that fed on them, they may have actually been a single organism in terms of their um, development to help them float. And so they would float around on the ocean currents, oftentimes in the shallow seas, but then would drift out into deeper ocean waters and filter feed.
basically out of the water column. So because they're filter feeders and they're also sessile organisms, one of the interesting things that you can get with graptolites is to understand at least how far away you are from the shoreline at particular time periods, how deep the water is. So there are a group of groups of graptolites that are what are called pandemics. That means that they're found in very wide areas and even out into deeper waters. And then there's the endemics. These are the graptolites that are found in sort of the shallow water systems. Many of these are the sessile organisms that live up in the photic zone. So you can use graptolites to give you kind of an indication of how close you are to the coastline, um, which is really important if you're doing any sort of basin analysis uh, of the rocks in these um, marine systems. Now one of the most interesting stories about graptolites is how they actually came to be used to solve one of the most perplexing, you know, nasty debates in geological history. Um, so I don't know if you know the story, but you know, when, when geologists were coming up with the geological time scale, there was a lot of debate going on. And one of the, the big debates that was going on in Britain was between Adam Sedgwick and Roderick Muchausen. Now, Adam Sedgwick is a big, huge, giant figure because he collected many, many fossils um, across the British Isles. Um, he is the one that came up with the name Cambrian. Um, they came up with Robert Muchausen is very famous. Um, both he and his wife traveled with Charles Lyell. In fact, um, his, his wife helped map out and many of the rock layers between uh, England and France in the early 1800s. They sort of helped inspire Charles Lyell to write the principles of geology. So these guys are uh, collecting fossils in the 1820s, coming up with these names. Roderick Muchausen named the Silurian period. And they were mapping the parts of Wales. Um, and Cedric had, had mapped a bunch of rocks as being his Cambrian-aged rocks, and he was finding fossils there. And Muchausen was mapping on the other side, but as he moved in, he called that all the Silurian. So you had two camps that developed in England in the early, mid-1800s. The camp that belonged to Roderick Muchausen believed that all the early time period of these early rocks were Silurian in age, and many of the followers of Adam Sedgwick um, believed that they were all Cambrian age. And they debated back and forth where they needed to define the line between the Cambrian and the Silurian. Well, it wasn't until we get into 1879 that um, Charles Lapworth began to sort of take on this debate between the Cambrian and Silurian and where to draw that line. And what he ended up doing was that he was finding that many of these rocks were not very fossiliferous, except many of them did have graptolites. Now, graptolites were sort of ignored by the earlier paleontologists, and he realized that these would be very important for defining a period of time between the Cambrian and the Silurian, which today we call the Ordovician. So uh, Charles Lapworth was the first to propose a new geological period between the Cambrian and Silurian called the Ordovician, and he defined it based on the appearance of many of these graptolite species that he was finding in England. So this is a distribution of um, Graptolites, and I mentioned that they are known from the Cambrian to Devonian. And what you'll notice about the Ordovician is that it was a time of great diversity of graptolites. So graptolites were particularly well represented in many Ordovician sites, particularly these black shales that had produced many uh, shelled uh, calcium carbonate uh, creatures. Um, so graptolites became a very important biostratigraphic index for rocks in the Ordovician. So, um, so graptolites, of course, go extinct at the Devonian. We don't have them living today, um, but they are very important if you're working in the early Paleozoic, principally, you know, working that strata between the Cambrian and Silurian. They are very helpful for identifying different time periods. All right, now here in Utah, we have some Ordovician rocks, and uh, I thought I'd just highlight two of the common graptolites that define the Ordovician rocks in Utah in the Fillmore Formation. This is Phylograftius, which is kind of a uh, sort of leaf-shaped graptolite. And then the one that's a little bit more common is the Didemographicus, which is a uh, doubled 
graptolite, so it kind of looks like a tuning fork. It has two branches coming off of there. Well, thank you for watching another exciting lecture um, at Utah State University. If you're interested in taking a class with Utah State University in geology, check out our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in what I do, check out my website at benjamin-burger.org. Thanks for watching again.